Cannibal. Welcome to this week's edition of Beat Beat. We are here with Glenn Wallace. He's unusual that he is a highly trained, a uh, Harvard educated, uh, he holds a PhD in Buddhist studies from Harvard's Department of Sanskrit and Indian Studies. Um, uh, philological training concentrating on Sanskrit, Pali, and Tibetan Buddhist literature. Uh, and he writes in his bio that for a long time, he has been concerned with how to make classical Buddhist literature, philosophy, and practice relevant to contemporary life. So much of his work stems from that concern. Um, now, I have been aware of Glenn myself for several years, beginning with a book called Cruel Theory, Sublime Practice, um, through a more recent book called The Ruins. Of, actually, it's The Ruins of the Western. I, 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 wanted, it be, I wanted it to be called, uh, uh, I wanted it to be called Ruins of the Buddhist Real, uh, mm -hmm. but it ended up being called Critical Crit 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 Western Buddhism. Yeah, Ruins of the Buddhist Real subtitle. And that was 2000? Um, uh, when was it? 2016 or something like that. 2019. Oh, <laughs> this one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, rather swiftly, this is two years ago. This was followed up by a very different kind of book, which is what we're here to talk about today, um, which is an anarchist's manifesto. Um, yes. And this is from Warbler Press. Um, and we will post a link to it. And this is really quite an outstanding book. And a lot of our questions have to do with this. But I think what we really wanted to do with this interview is to give an introduction to people who are not already familiar with Glenn um, and sort of give a portrait of his journey, which I personally find um, extremely interesting. And so I guess to begin, um, I don't want to begin, I guess, with the text. I want to begin with what came before. Um, in the text, you do talk about um, you do talk about your kind of punk rock background, your uh, luck, your your fortuitous exposure to free schools, et cetera, and these kind of various subaltern and counterculture forces that formed you. Um, but what I always wonder is with this book, Cruel Theory, Sublime Practice, which I hope you could say more about for a general public, what came before that? So what is Cruel Theory, Sublime Practice, 2013? Um, okay, yeah. And can you explain what the kind of intellectual, spiritual journey was that led to that event? To, to Cruel Theory, Sublime Practice? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, let's see. Wow. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, it's all, it's all somehow connected, all this work. I also have this education book that I wrote in between the critique and the anarchist manifesto. And I have these different types of work I'm doing with Buddhism. Like you mentioned, trying to make it accessible to modern day Americans, but I've also done more critical work. I've also done more philologically. Somehow it's all connected. I'm not exactly sure how, but uh, writing the, the essay in, in Cruel Theory of Blind Practice was a culmination, I think, of what was brewing all along from the very beginning and ended up in this, you know, in many ways, like, you know, take no, Prisoners, no holds barred critique of Buddhism. And you know, I've been involved with Buddhism since I was very, very young. So it was very, very formative for me. I mean, it was like 15 or so. I really got very serious. And um, just slowly over the years, you know, I started realizing that there were certain, certain qualities to Buddhism that were very problematic. And there were similar qualities that I found in capitalism or in, you know, the modern world that led to a kind of... The, the, the anarchism, anarchist work. It's hard to say like what the spiritual journey is, but I think it begins with, um, oh, some, some people have texted me about the Twitch stream. I don't know if you have. We uh, posted it to Twitter. Uh, so okay. um, um, I, think, I think from very, very early on, I think I, think I, can, I, can, sum, I can boil it down to this. But very early on, I was very disturbed by, um, is everything all right? Yeah, we're good. 
uh, disturbed by kind of authoritarian practices, uh, going back to grade school, I think, and it's just kind of restrictive structures like the classroom or having these authorities who could treat other people in, in you know, less than admirable ways and get away with it, teachers and so forth. I, I think it's really, all oh, this is a journey of trying to figure out how to undo authority and coercive structures. Was there a time, I mean, it, it's interesting because I, I, uh, I recall a point in my own sort of late 20s, early 30s, when I thought, wait a minute, conformity, that's actually really serious business. And there's this kind of idea that you become a good subject of capitalism, late capitalism in the US, and you sort of give up on things that we talk about in middle school and high school, right? You're supposed to abandon these kind of childish things about talking about conformity or anti-authority. And so it's interesting to watch you rediscover, in a sense, some yeah. of that and actually see the yeah. wisdom. I was, exactly. I was going to say so there's a lot of wisdom in seventh and eighth grade, you know, <laughs> you know all in terms of, of conform, you know, anti-conformity kind of thinking, anti-hierarchy thinking, anti-authority, authority. authority. About what's the point of any of it? You know, we all die in the end anyway. And, oh, you know, you're just like an emo seventh grader. But there's a wisdom to it, absolutely. And absolutely. maybe we have mature forms later on, and we can start thinking about it in mature ways. But uh, that original impulse is is there very early for some people, I think. Did you say a ritual or ritual? Because that's another question I want to ask you about later. A ritual. You said original, I think. Okay. Um, I said a ritual, but I did write about ritual. My very first book is about ritual. Yeah. Um, I, that's something I want to get to in talking about the Stranger Sutra and some of the things you've said about ritual. Um, but to, to kind of go back a little bit to your sort of biography, was there a time, let's say, when you, Glenn, was a member of a very influential uh, punk rock band or hardcore band, punk rock band in Philadelphia in the late 70s and early 80s? And um, uh, which is actually their catalog has since been re-released by uh, the great Southern Lord. Um, a few yeah. years ago. And, uh, but they are, they're touted as the first Buddhist punk rock band. Um, and I wonder uh, sort of like the later, you know, kind of Krishna core, this sort of movement. Um, was there a time when you were sort of both involved in the anti-authority punk system? You, you talk a bit about this, but, um, and you saw Buddhism as the answer. So was there a way in which sort of get more neatly yeah. aligned to really understand that Buddhism would liberate from authority? I really, I was very convinced very early on that Buddhism had some goods in it that could be liberatory, just to use that word, that could free us from, from certain strictures that, that we find ourselves in. I, I, I believe that still. Um, I, I, maybe it's interesting to mention that my very first exposure to Buddhism, like with a teacher, was in this free school I went to. Right. And what they asked me, what do you want to learn? I said, how about some Asian philosophy? My father gave me a book on Ram Das, So I, I was interested in Buddhism and Eastern thought. And uh, so I started reading the Dhammapada, an early Buddhist text with this guy, Bruce, who was just you know a local person who somehow they found to come in and, and study with me. Uh, and we would read the Dhammapada together. But the thing about Bruce was he was had just dropped out in a, from a management training program at IBM because he'd realized the role they had played in Vietnam and gathering data that led to death and so forth. And he kind of had this epiphany one night and just dropped out. So we read the Dhammapada uh, from both like, it was like, it was a simplistic question from the very beginning. I wasn't that aware of this at the time. Looking back, it became more clear is that, is that he, 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 had, he was operating with the social critique and was looking at this Buddhist material to ask if it might have resources for addressing the social issues of the day. So, and he would kind of ruminate as we read a verse. So he had this, he was critical of the Buddhist text, but at the same time, really interrogating it for what I'm going to offer. And I'd say, I guess I was really affected by that in some, in some weird unconscious way, because that, that describes what I'm up to to this very day, interrogating the Buddhist material. One of the things I found very early about Buddhism early on was unlike other religions, you realize, oh, it, it makes these claims about what's possible in terms of human awakening, self-development. And it also gives you the practice to do. That is the same practice that the original sort of figure himself did. And I thought that was fascinating, that it, that, that it had a robust practice to go along with its claims. So, yeah, I, I've stayed with Buddhism to this day. It's just that, you know, if you've read any of my critical work, I see there are certain yes. issues. Yeah. 
your critical order is very challenging too to bring in because it is quite challenging. Um, it's very, very rewarding. Um, but I'm, I'm wary to some degree because I want, I really want sort of a general audience to become aware of your book because I think it's so powerful. Um, but one question about cruel theory, sublime practice. So this is a book that you, you co-authored with, with Tom Pepper and but, uh, Martin Steingas, yes. Um, uh, this had a tremendous impact on me um, in oh. 2013 uh, when it came out. Actually, it was at a time when I had broken ties with a somewhat authoritative kind of uh, Buddhist group uh, in its own right. And you were, Zizek, I think at that point, you know, was kind of known already for sort of saying uh, a little bit about kind of Buddhism as sort of producing, you know, good capitalist subjects. It's become a panacea, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But what you... Uh, the three of you did with this book, I think took that critique into a place of much greater depth, much greater analysis. And obviously without, uh, well, I, I think you guys have a wonderful performative style, uh, yeah. you sort of uh, not have Zizek's kind of cheeky um, disregard for uh, dialogue in some regard that, that he does. Um, but I, what I wanted to ask you about is Cruel. So, you know, you've written quite a bit about Cruel and Darteau in particular. And this is a place where I'd really love to hear you extrapolate if you're willing, because I find it very powerful. And I think your interpretation of Artaud and what you have to say about him is actually very important. Um, so that I would ask you about cruelty. Yeah, yeah, I'm really happy to land on that title because it really it really summarized something about the book. Cruel theory uh, maybe leads or makes possible something like a sublime practice. We were thinking of sublime in the Kantian sense of something that's somehow outside of our current capabilities, but is shimmering there as a possibility. And the cruel really came through, like, yeah, Artaud's idea of the theater of cruelty, where he says, I want to, I want to create a theater that wakes people up, nerves and heart, that, that shakes them to the core. When they walk into the theater, they're, they're going to leave different people. They're going to leave with a different insight about what their lives is and how they've been, how they've been structured by the society around them and how in what ways that's problematic. Theater should be cr cruel in this sense. It shouldn't be a place of conformity or of mere entertainment that makes functioning in a sick society all the easier because you've had your night out and you're rested and you go back the next day into the maelstrom. Uh, that was his concept of cruelty was actually a formation that presented, that made present to the, the participant deep, uh, un unavoidable, un non-controversial human truths, kind of what Heidegger calls like the hardness of fate kinds of truths about it, about f finitude and death and, and depression and these sorts of things. I, that that was a basic idea of cruelty. Uh, maybe it'd be interesting to add there. I mean, we, you can ask me more about cruelty if you like, but um, I originally had the contract to write that book myself but um, you know, I had this blog at the time, Speculative Non-Buddhism. Um, I still have it, it's just not as active, but there, these two people were writing on the blog comments that were struck me as so interesting and such a different angle from what I was taking. That was Tom Pepper and Matthias Steingas. And I asked them to, to, to join me in writing this. So I ended up just writing my part because I thought it's also in the spirit of collaboration that I actually wanted to, to to perform yeah. and not to talk about, you know. And, and, and I wonder then actually, um, you know, because your move, it seems like your move towards a vocal anarchism as is really expressed in this yeah. book was gradual. Um, I noticed for instance, that a few years ago, you referred to yourself as the director of insight seminars. And then I noticed in the book, you say, <laughs> I'm explicitly not the director of insight yeah, exactly. seminars, which That's is what I right. love. Um, yeah. Yeah. But that, I wonder if that sort of moment of collaborating you know, with these people who had been, in a sense, your not your fans, but your readers, um, was that was that meaningful? Was it deeply meaningful in terms of moving towards a new kind of sangha? Yeah, yeah, absolutely was. In fact, another part of that was Tom Pepper and me and Steingas uh, operate in, in very different ways. Like we dif disagree with each other more than we. I don't know. Maybe it's fifty fifty. We can take care of. That. Um, um, you know. Tom Pepper really works from with Althusser and, and Steingas with, with Foucault, and I work with Laura Well, and that, that leads you to do all kinds of different analyses that don't necessarily overlap. And so that's an interesting point you make, this gradual, gradually becoming more vocal about anarchism. I will say something briefly about that. In 2006, I read a book by Ju Judith Suissa, S-U-I-S-S-A. -S -S she wrote a book called uh, Anarchism in Education. And it, it just really shook me because it, 
it, it, it brought back to mind my own experience in this free school I went to in the 70s. And it, it, it made me realize that, oh my God, like everything I've been doing in the classroom with my band, with inside seminars, with, with, with speculative non-Buddhism, was trying to, to realize these values that I learned in the free school, which is an anarchist oriented free school, just didn't use that language. Um, so that was in 2006. So I, I gradually started becoming more vocal about sort of this anarchist orientation. Um, and the real catalyst was in uh, just a year or so ago, um, the editor, the founder of Warpler Press asked me explicitly, because she, she actually came out with my book on education. I call it a pamphlet yes. uh, on education. And she, she astutely noticed it seems it seems to be have, have kind of an anarchist sentiment to it. I never <laughs> that in there at all. Would you like to write about anarchism? So that was the immediate catalyst. But the earlier one was reading this book on education and, and really being reminded of the values that ha have been informing, you know, my life. So right. Well, and so what can we specifically say about anarchism and education? Um. Well, education is super important for anarchism because anarchism is non-foundational, non-essentialist. It doesn't believe that there's some inherent human nature that, uh, that we all just act, act, act out of. Uh, the, you know, uh, Kropotkin made this claim that, that human, you know, he, try, he, he tried to argue against um, um, Charles, Charles Dar Darwin. Uh, you... Sorry, we have a little... Sorry, we have a little access. Take care of it. Hey, Glenn. Hey, hey Liz. <laughs> Sorry, I, I I I've been getting some text saying that they're, they're trying to get on the Twitch. But I don't know if there's a message there. There is, and I'm trying okay. to man. Um, I'm trying to man emails while you guys were talking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're inviting people here, but can't share the link because of the university. So we're oh. so if people want a private message. That would be the best way. Yeah. And, um, I'm trying to private message some of the people on Twitch right now. I'll just, you know, I don't know. I think these messages are gone. So I'm just going to post it there. Um, anyway, were you just starting to talk about your, I'm sorry, where were you guys? With <laughs> I'm trying to remember too. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Did he hurt himself? Is he okay? Uh, he's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, COVID's stressful. Oh, I, oh yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah. The, <laughs> a lot of adults would like to cry like that as well. I'm yes, sure. definitely. <laughs> um, I, I, what was the train of thought? What, what the heck? What? Uh, the people watching this later will be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so I, I thought I heard you talking about your schooling experience. And that was something that I was really curious about uh, because you've had such an illustrious academic career and I know that you're doing so much at Insight. So I don't yeah. know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big part of my story because I started out schooling, refusing to go to school, literally. Like I, this is the old age, you walk to school. When I was in first grade, I would literally walk back home. I hated to go to school. My mother very, very late in her life said that I had a school phobia. My psychologist friends tell me there's no actual such thing, but I think she just meant I, was, I always got very uncomfortable in school environments. Um, so from very, very early on, I was very, very uncomfortable in school environments. Uh, eventually we found this free school, which made sense. Unfortunately, it didn't last long, a year and a half. So I ended up dropping out. Uh, so it's a long, circuitous, you know, route to my graduate education. I ended up going to Germany. I, what I discovered was in Germany, you're really left alone. Like the professors don't care if you're there. No one cares if you get a degree or turn in the paper. It's 
you're, you're autonomous. And I discovered that I had a real, that that really worked for me, that, that, that uncoerced kind of thinking and scholarly work uh, worked for me. And um, so, yeah, um, I came back and finished my graduate studies at Harvard because I thought I want to make a career out of this. Um, so, and I, I studied Sanskrit, so I better go to a, a highly respected school. And it also just happened to be a kind of program that was similar to what I was doing in Germany. In fact, I came back and visited a bunch of different departments and they all said, how do you want to do your studies? Like, what's the methodology? And I'd always talk about it in ways they say like, oh, you have to go to Harvard. They're the only ones who do this like old school philological approach. They're studying the text and the languages. But um, yeah, that, I ended up writing this also be, as a kind of distillation of my experience in, in schooling, um, which you know, never went well as a kid, junior high school. I mean, I had, I had, I had periods in junior high school. I didn't go for weeks and weeks at a time. Um, yeah. So it's kind of, uh, ironic. Uh, remember. but obviously you've dedicated so much of your life yeah. to the pursuit of knowledge. So, yeah. yeah. Well, there's so uh, many questions there. <laughs> I mean, like the one reason I remember like enrolling in, in college was I, I really wanted to learn yeah. philosophy. And I thought, you know, college is a place where you systematically read things and people help you out and figure it out. So, you know, I went there with that kind of motivation in mind. It was never to get a degree or anything like that. So it's always a school is supposed to be the play, the institution for learning. You know, the, I don't know if you've you read much with, the, uh, you know, um, Moten, the idea of the undercommons, where, where he's, you know, this, well, this questioning of whether something like learning and education happens better outside of the existing institution that touches very much on on what i'm talking about in in this book in terms of the mezzo level of anarchism of creating extra or counter institutions where we can do the kinds of things that the larger institution is supposed to be doing but we would argue are not doing well um yeah it is interesting that a person who turns out to have pretty good capacity for learning does so poorly in school right yeah <laughs> well it was never the purpose of the school right that's what I, I always think. That's why I tell my students, I, like, what is the actual purpose of college? And, you know, they have to conclude eventually that it might be just simply the selling of credits, you know, <laughs> kind of like Bitcoin, educational Bitcoin or something. Yeah. Um, do you have a pedagogical idea that you're really excited about today? That, that's interesting you ask that. I mean, I talk a, lot, talk a lot about pedagogy here, like Jacques Ranciere's idea of the ignorant schoolmaster you know, if you're not teaching to, to liberate in terms of the, the way you go about teaching, helping people find their intelligence and courage and, and creativity, then you're liberate, then you're teaching to stultify or to make stupid. That that's a basic pedagogical idea. Um I, I kind of outline all that here. I do that in the classroom. And of course, it, it's difficult because the classroom structure kind of forces you into a kind of make a kind of authority figure, being authority figure. It's hard to maneuver around that, but I do my best. Um, yeah, this is this kind of outlines my thinking on pedagogy. Um, and it's very much what I learned in the free school, really. It's just have, I, like I'd often tell my students, um, you know, we're having a conversation about something that seems like it should be interesting. I mean, they signed up for the course. It's interesting material from Buddhism or Confucianism or Taoism or philosophy. And they're very reluctant to talk. And I was like, if we were sitting at a bar, like around a big school, like table drinking beer and having a conversation about this topic, what would you do? And they'd be all like, oh, we'd be all animated and, and you know, talking. I think, mean, why can't we do it here? You know, and, and they can't really answer that question. But there's something about the very go back to what you're saying about ritual, Matt, the ritualized form of education, sitting in these little chairs with the, the big shot up here. And the, 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 the you know, oh, I know what, now I remember we were talking about the role of education. And the sort of competitive nature of the, the system and all the anxiety and all that that goes on. That So Matt was asking about the, the role of education and anarchism. And I think a basic idea is that since we are not, we don't have some sort of essential nature, the difference is, at, is education. The ed, education can turn us into, like Darwin was arguing, you know, competitive, you know, creatures or cooperative ones, like, like Kropotkin was arguing. Uh, 
you know, this is a this is an aside that I think you'll like. Uh, when you said Darwin, I you know, and we think about Darwin versus Kropotkin. Um, uh, I'm not sure it's even leading anywhere, but I think you'll appreciate it. Darwin, at the end of his life, did all these studies of plants. He was really interested in studying plants that moved. And there's this line in one of his journals where he talks about his research and whether or not it succeeded. And he says, but I'm afraid to say we've harmed a great number of these beings. And I find it really interesting because we all, we have this idea for Darwin to stand in, right? For kind of this, you know, really sort of negative um, part of what is modernity or post-modernity. Um, and at the same time, it sort of is so heartening to see that kind of small ethical impulse um, there. But um, when you mentioned ritual and the sort of idea of the classroom as ritual, that really struck with me because when you uh, you did a, an AMA on Reddit uh, a few years yeah. ago, and uh, um, you talked about the notion of how do we create rituals for the kind of subjects that we, we are trying to be, we are aspiring to be, the communities we're trying to build. Um, so that's sort of part one is to hear you say maybe a bit more about that and sort of about, like as your journey through Buddhism has progressed or changed, evolved, how has your notion of ritual evolved alongside it? And then also, and that's a bigger question, you've written this piece called The Stranger Sutra, um, which I think I'd, I'd like to hear a lot about. I mean, I think it's quite beautiful and I'd like the context of it, maybe an explanation for people who are, yeah. are not familiar. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the context of that is just what you're talking about is it's giving thought to how we might develop a, a ritualized form of practice that creates the kind of subject that, so a lot of times the, the, the actual subject, the person who's created in participating in a ritual, whether it's like the classroom ritual or an actual like Buddhist ritual of, of meditation or you know, Zen protocol or whatever, it, it's it's never made explicit, which is interesting. That's one thing already I'd want to correct. Like no one ever said, or maybe maybe it is make it explicit in certain ways. Like, do you remember your Shambhala, Shambhala rituals? Was there some notion of what kind of person you would be at the end of all this producing? Was there some notion of that? Very much so, yes. So, so maybe it is made explicit in a kind of parallel way, like, like it's all, this is the stuff we do, and this is the kind of person we want to create, and it all goes together somehow. Well, what if, what if you started off by saying, what kind of subject do I want to create, and give thought to that? So, so one, one of the ideas behind the Stranger Sutra is create a subject who is, 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 the way it puts it in the sutra, is fit for the clash with hell which is a, a Laura Wellen trope kind of about someone who's able to really operate in the world against what he calls the authorities or the, the perpetual harassment of the world on us, defining who we are, how we should be, what we should think, what's possible. And then not only the world is a large structure, but all the little communities we're in are doing the same kinds of harassments, like, like over-determining what's possible for us. And so what if you had a ritual that says the whole ritual assumes a stranger subject, some, someone who lives in a resistance, awareness to and resistance to this kind of harassment and who has the courage to operate in the world, to, to act in the world. So what would that look like? What would a text look like? What would a practice look like? And, we're, and who figures it out? Not the enlightened sage, but we figure this out together. So it's very, very collaborative. There's actually, I, I published that on the blog, but there's a, a Talmudic text. One of the participants created a Talmudic text of the Stranger Sutra that's filled with, with arguments and explanations and footnotes and side ideas. And so it's this rich living text. And that's part I, of- I, actually, I'm thrilled to read this. I only saw mention of it very recently and I can't wait to take a look at it. That's part of the pra practice itself is, is thinking through this together. So- um, and then there's also a contemplative practice embedded in it, like that, that's kind of a, I call a Buddha fictional account of the, of the Anapanasati Sutta, the, the Buddhist breathing uh, meditation practice. I, I think that's important. It's important that we, contemplation is important. It's a, I think it should be cultivated, sitting still and silent and attentive is a very valuable human activity, I believe. I just think that it's too often put in the service of an of an idealism and of and as, and and of an irresponsible social subject. Personally, the practice itself I think is quite beautiful. And I think when you you really kind of call it when you name it the medicalization 
you know, sort of mindfulness. That really, that's a phrase that stuck with me quite a bit. I mean, I think that's a very powerful way to understand it. And, you know, some of my own research around psychedelia, the same thing is happening now, right? I mean, yeah. there's a yeah. right. uh, mystical experience. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, that's what makes it okay, okay right? Is that, yeah. Oh, there's a medical, you know, purpose here. But I wanted to, um, you know, so when you talk about utopia, and in your book, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm jumping ahead and I'd like to also just kind of give an introduction to the book, but I do want to ask you this question. Um, when you talk about kind of the planes, right? You sort of talk about the plane of, I would say the plane of possibility in a yeah. sense. Um, and and kind of the, uh, do you have a question? No, no. Oh. Um, I, I, uh, I was really interested in this notion of impossible nonviolence. Um, you know, I think this came out of a discussion with Tasha Leonard Right. Um, and I found it really intriguing, but I, I have to say, I found it in part intriguing because it reminded me so much of the Vajrayana. Um, and so it actually felt like a small return in a way, actually, to, you know, what may be a controversial, you know, interpretation of Buddhism. But I felt like it was almost in line with sort of the way in which the now sort of disgraced Trungpa Rinpoche talked about compassion. And so I was curious to kind of hear your thoughts on this. Can you say more about that? That's very interesting. Well, the notion that compassion is not, you know, the kind of um, rudimentary kindness or gentleness, you know, that yeah. we would be, we would be off to, we would often associate it with, but that sometimes compassion is to slap someone in the face, you know, um, yes. and clearly this led to a tremendous amount of uh, really misinformed, unenlightened uh, kind of violence in those communities, you know, a lot of destruction um, but at the same time, that wisdom is never, the pith wisdom there has always stuck with me, right? Compassion is not what we think it is. Um, yeah. Compassion is situational, right? And so in a way, for me, that version of compassion actually is really productive because it opens up a sphere of how we respond and how we become certain kinds of subjects. Um, yeah. I thought there was kind of a linkage there in thinking that, you know, yeah. Is, yeah. yeah, that's great. I mean, so... In other words, compassion is not not being nice. It's not being nice. It's not necessarily being gentle. Like actual compa I mean, compassion means obviously to feel deeply with or to feel with. It, it's it's kind of, it's a an, an image. I mean, I think you know the crucifixion of Christ is called the passion. I mean, it, it's it's a big heavy thing, and that somehow it's been turned in in Western Buddhist discourse as a kind of nice thing. I think of Barbara Ehrenreich's work on the tyranny of positivity and of niceness and, you know, the, 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 the compulsion to, to be nice and so forth. Um, yeah. So you want to say that that's an example of like impossible nonviolence. Is, that, is this what you're suggesting that if you're really involved in, in a practice that, that, that values compassion, there's going to be difficulty and maybe like volatile emotions and language that, that, that's going to look prop, like I don't know, you know, violent to use to use a term. I mean, is that is this what you're suggesting? Well, it's what I'm suggesting. I mean, I'm not suggesting it as a thesis so much yeah. as kind of associations. I'm curious for your thoughts on, in part because I wonder how it relates back to cruelty. You know, yeah. sort of the way in which you use cruelty yeah. very right. protectively, despite um, you know, obviously the associations some would have with it. And so, I mean, I'm I'm kind of interrogating you because I'm curious if you yeah. see these connections or if I'm off. No, I, I think that's great. Really interesting connections. Um, we had a seminar yesterday um, with someone who she 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 left academia and she became a tarot card reader and even has a school and and it was it occurred to me that she a lot of people who come to her seminar have a certain kind of language and discourse around around you know well being and self care and this sort of thing. I'm not saying it was explicit. But I noticed there was something in her in her discourse that was pushing back against the language of transformation and well-being and you know being kind and all this thing. It created a certain tension. And maybe I was the only one who felt it. I don't know, but maybe it's because I'm interested in these, these kinds of issues you raise. And she was questioning notions of the language of transformation and all this sort of thing. And it occurred to me, she started off talking about the importance of discipline. And 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 it, what occurred to me was that her whole way of talking about what she was talking about, it was called the childless witch, uh, the, the seminar, uh, um, really goes against the grain of current discourse, particularly in America. 
of you know safe spaces and and honoring you know the way people use respecting really kind of to me kind of means like not questioning or critiquing and this you know everyone i feel like is walking around on you know trying like on eggshells with one another we're living in in that environment um now so um it's yeah it seems very risky to talk in terms of cruelty and uh yeah not, n impossible nonviolence, right i mean um but i think i think I, 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 you know, when I look at my own training, it involved, I even hear, you know, young academics leaving academia now because they feel like it's cruel. Yeah. You know, what they're subjected to harshness and like kinds of abuses that to me, you know, and again, you know, I'm, I'm not a good, you know, I'm, I'm an older generation and all this. I come out of kind of a different, different background, a lot of the younger academics I'm, I'm encountering, but I thrived on, on discipline and, and I thrive like, you know, um, in some weird way on, on having a firm authority, which is kind of ironic, like the Zen teacher. At some point I realized the limits of it, but I like the Zen saying that goes first comes discipline and then comes freedom. Mm. I, and that's why I also would tell people to come to the blog, like don't read this blog until you've really put in the time in, in, with serious Buddhist practice. Um, is it like it, it's too early to critique it if you haven't really disciplined yourself yet. Um, so but, and just to cut in, I, I realized that given the um, exhilaration I felt for this interview and kind of how rich and rhythmatic it is, I'm not sure we've even clearly said yet that Glenn is both the, and we may have said it, the founder of Insight Seminars um, and also really, in, in some sense, I would say the progenitor of speculative non-Buddhism, um, which is yeah. ongoing both, but now it's also a practice group, the speculative non-Buddhist posse, is that right? Yeah, yeah we call it... Uh what we call non-Buddhist practice posse, where we're trying to figure out what practice might look 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 like, given the line, you know, long lines, a non-idealist practice, a non-coercive practice, et cetera, et cetera, a socially responsible practice. When you, when you mentioned this paradox about sort of like kind of, um, you know, having that sort of utility of the authority figure, and then we talked earlier about kind of the anti-authority impulse and the importance of it, right, and how that figures into your book in some ways. What do you think about sort of like cluster, you know, and this notion of kind of the the person who holds the figure of authority as an act of sort of self-negation to a degree? Is that one that's useful for you or meaningful for you or has come up or been inspirational? I mean, well, not not not. I, I I've only encountered his work in some. We had a couple of seminars on ritual, and so I don't really know his work that well, but. Um, I, I think you might be raising an, an issue I do think about, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's so we're, we're kind of landing on the, this idea that authority does have an importance and a function. So this idea of like a, a, a outright anti-authoritarianism, just like an outright anti-hierarchy uh, uh, might, might be problematic and might be something disingenuous about it, that it might not be possible or necessary or, or even valuable. Like, so the question then becomes, I, this might be what you just suggested is, uh, how do you exercise your authority? You know, how do you, how do you, how, what, what is the nature of the hierarchies and how, how entrenched are they in the structure? So that are they allowed to be fluid and changing depending on what's happening so rather than just say some sort of, uh, fantastic idea that there's no such thing as hierarchy or authority. Maybe these things will emerge, but the question is how, to me, how they're, they're exercised and how they're practiced. So I try, try to practice my authority in a way that that is negating and tries to give ever a, a more right. confident authority to the, the student or the interlocutor or the practitioner. So I don't know if that's what- so I think it's very different. similar. I mean, it's yeah. sort of the notion of the chief who, holds power in order. I mean, the idea is that the simple idea is that the chief holds power so that the state won't emerge. Um, and I, I mean, it's endlessly interesting, you know, uh, also subject to many interpretations and maybe he was wrong, but at the same time, the idea is quite beautiful. Um, yes. Yes. I, I wonder then when you, you, what was the first inspiration for this book? I know you say Mary um, from Warbler. Um, yeah. suggested it. And I have to say the one of your books I have not engaged is the education book, which yeah. I will do and I feel bad about now. I, um, it a pamphlet. I tried to make it really small, like a pamphlet, but 
come out a little too big. I have, I, you know, it's funny because I have a PDF of it or a copy of it. And I yeah. just, it's one of those things that came in the wrong moment and then fell by the wayside, but I will do you definitely read it. Um, so this we will post it as well, how to fix education, but what, but beyond Mary's suggestion and her kind of, you know, reading of the text, what, what was their pivotal moment where you clicked, you know, that you wanted to write an anarchist manifesto? Well, I mean, Trump's rhetoric was a part of it. Um, Trump's election was a part of it. Realize, oh God, we're in deep shit here. This guy could actually get eight years. Can you imagine eight years? I mean, at the very beginning, anyone who knew Trump even before he was president realized eight years of Trump as president is going to be deep. So I thought it's time to take the plunge and to really start thinking about how to act in the world. And part of that was, well, you love education. Uh, you're very unhappy with, I, you know, I gave up tenure as a professor. I don't know if you know yes. that. We're going to get to that because that we're yeah. very interested to hear more about it. I know it's, it's an unusual thing to do. And, um, and so I, I said, um, I'll start building an institution of education, not an institution, but a, a formation of education. Um, I mean, yeah, all this kind of came together. I wasn't explicitly thinking like anarchism. It, to me, that that's one thing I'm a point I'm making here is that, um, uh, Marquis Bay talks about anarchism as a world-making sensibility. I like that very much. I, I like very much thinking of it in terms of the values that animate it rather than the, the strategies, say. So I think that these values were coming to life in me again. Um, and I wanted to direct them. I was trying to direct them towards the classroom, but that seemed insufficient and puny. I wanted to do something bigger. So Insight Seminars was was my thinking and it was in the context of, of the world that was emerging under trump okay kind of stupid, unintelligent uh you know any you know your my facts are as good as your facts and i you know i wanted to, to create intelligent uh, conversations around i thought important ideas and did you feel as though um I mean, did you feel as though, I mean, you, you do talk about this in the book but sort of with the rise of aoc with the rise of bernie and sort of you know, a kind of post-occupy sort of further left sensibility, you know, that kind of got exacerbated with Trump. I mean, did you feel as though this was, you know, a moment to be seized in some sense to, you know, a fissure where this a fissure where this could kind of actually, you know, where say uh, someone's parent who is a kind of centrist Democrat could actually be open to, uh, you know, what uh, David Greber wrote, you know, in that the piece you mentioned. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I do actually, uh, I, you're, you're touching slightly on the point that I, I wrote this very explicitly with, with liberals in mind. So that was yeah, a, yeah. kind of the hope that was invested in, in Obama and then Hillary Clinton. And I, I'm like, what? Like, yes, there are, there would be a different world, you know, to a great extent for a lot of people under Hillary Clinton than it was under Donald Trump. Yes, I'll grant them, you know, and yet, you know, somehow it keeps it keeps spinning around and keeps going on. So it's sort of like seeing, I remember having conversations with liberal friends of mine and being kind of just flabbergasted by their, the hope they were placing in Hillary Clinton, you know, and um, and again, it all comes together. It's like, you know, reading, reading Julius Suisse's book and remembering my own experiences and, you know, um, actually losing a job in a Buddhist institute. I'd worked it for 10 years. That, that came to near a, an end in, what was it, 2016? So right around the same time. Um, not wanting to go back into mainstream academia. Right. Uh, all kind of, you know, a big a big kind of point of mine, anyone who knows me is, I, I'm always kind of com complaining that we don't know how to have conversations. We don't know how to have dialogues anymore. And there's nothing more satisfying wow. than a deep kind of therapeutic intelligent conversation and why not create a forum for that there's 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 a quote in here from uh that i think kind of summarizes what we're talking about it's a you know, ep epigram or whatever it's called um oh where is it um in the epigram yeah it's, it's or where, where the heck is it? it's it's uh oh wait oh no it's in the education book sorry um <laughs> Uh, sits Henri de Farbe, who says, change life, change society. These pre precepts mean nothing without the production of an appropriate space. You guys know about this. Yes. New, new social relationships call for a new space and vice versa. So that was a lot of thinking at the time, too, was like, 
we need I need to create a new space to kind of just a new fresh space to manifest these values that I think are important. And yeah. I mean, and 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 you have and you've created insight and yeah. Um, so just in terms of the history of Insight, um, am I right that it did begin as a meat space and is now fully yeah, virtual? Absolutely. Okay. In fact, um, we were adamant about not streaming. <laughs> we're, at, we're like, no, we want this to be face to face, human to human, humans in a room together. <laughs> we made that mistake also one week before COVID. So we feel you. Um, <laughs> now, now with the, the vaccine and, and potential changes, what do you see? Um, what do you see for the future? Of insight. I mean, I we're, we're, going to stay, we're going to stay online, of course. It's been so, and we have people from all over the world. Interesting. And we're going to keep that element, but I, we're also going to have uh, what you call it a meat element, right? You know, yeah. We also have that, like go in Philadelphia, like a space downtown. Um, I think that's one point. It's hard to imagine it right now, isn't it? But I'd be happy to get, I'd be happy to get, get back to that. I, I really would like to, I've always had a fantasy of creating more of a, of, of a school like. A curriculum or something that people could take. It wouldn't. It wouldn't have credits. It wouldn't be tied to the economy in any way. But I always had that fan. It, much like what you said, you and Liz. I mean, when we first talked about uh, yes, we cannibal. You said that one reason you wanted to do it was because you remember how important these spaces were to you when you were young. Yes. And, and I feel the same way about continuing to work with Inside Seminars. Like it's becoming even more apparent to me now as I get older how important. My my free school experience was, and I'd like to create that for other people. You know, I, like our. I think my my pri my most proud moment right now actually is uh, we're doing an event next weekend. There's a young woman named Brianna um, who's just a 19 year old artist in town um, who we just kind of met randomly, and she approached us and said, "I want to do an art show." She said, "There's not a lot of spaces for young black artists to show in." uh Baton Rouge you know and so she and I was like yeah definitely you know and she's like how much does it cost and we got to say oh it's free don't worry about it please come do this and then she put together this show and then there's this brilliant uh MC performing and there's a soul singer performing and so it's kind of like finally seeing this thing manifest of just like you know providing just this space for encounter and making it a gift you know like making it free um quite literally so, so I think we we share that kind of that vision. Um, yeah. And and on that note, though, it is we have to we're operating in a capitalist society, so we have to figure out this other part. Um, we do have a seminar coming up with Charles Eisenstein, right? It's about yes. sacred economics. That might be relevant. I don't know his work that well, uh, but Natalia uh, also does programming. Says her life was changed by his work, so I'm very curious to get more deeply into it. But, but we, but, but this is like I think we had an exchange on Twitter once, and like we live in contradiction. Um, like we struggle. I wrung ha my hands constantly over pricing, and we still have like, a free option, a solidarity ticket. We, we we insist on always making that a possibility. But but you also and you guys, I'm sure, experience it too. It's like the, you put more and more time in it, more, more and more expenses, more and more effort. I mean, when people get the only criticism I get about this book is from anarchists who get mad that it, it costs money. And I, <laughs> I, I always make this argument. I say, if you really analyze it from the very beginning to the very end, all the labor, resources, time, energy, money, output that happens, but you at the very end want to take it for free. I mean, it's nothing's free in capitalism. Like, really? Like, you guys are paying for these free events. Absolutely. that you. It's being so the, the it's sort of like the question of authority or leadership or hierarchies. It's not whether it can really be eliminated because all all the evidence suggests that that might not be possible nor the uh, you know desirable. You know there are lots of examples we can come up with. You want someone to have an authority, a special knowledge. It's a question of how they they practice it. Uh, it it's similar here. It's, it might not be a question of 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 you know. Uh, maybe it's not really possible to avoid the exchange of money, but it's a question of how we go about doing that and, and what kind of spirit it's conveyed with such of the people that come into the formation can be transformed by it. Like, I hope that when people see this costs so much for a member, you, you also have you know, so much for a non member, you also have the option to make a donation. You also have an option to come for free. I'm hoping that that also, you know, affects a person. Right. You know, so that they no longer tolerate the assumption that something has the fantasy that something has a set value and you must pay that money, that there are other ways of going about 
financial exchange. So I just bought a book, um, a fiction book, whose premise is that this young couple living in Berlin who are getting squeezed by housing prices, uh, the guy works for a biotech company that invents a pill that leads to momentary generosity. And <laughs> that's the whole premise that sold me on it. Um, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Uh, oh, that sounds fair. What's the name of that book? It's called Oval by Wilk, Elvia Wilk, maybe. Well, um, so are, are people are people voluntarily taking the pill for temporary generosity? That I, sounds like I can't wait to read it. But, you know, set against this whole like being squeezed on all sides monetarily, this idea that you could then have this temporary generosity. Well, maybe the trick is generosity. to get your, the banker or the landlord to take the pill. <laughs> is that <laughs> the idea? Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to look that up. That sounds really fascinating. I, I think we all think about something. We're all uncomfortable around money. We don't like the role that, that like, I, I start off the, the education book. It starts off saying, um, um, and maybe this will make you want to read it, Matt. It says, Oh, I do want to read it. Don't misunderstand. <laughs> we assume the capture of the American university by the national economic dogma, as Nietzsche called education in the service of money making careerism, what concrete actions might a change-minded teacher take? This is the question driving how to fix education. So, you know, the national economic dogma is over-determining even our artistic projects, our education projects that, that you know, so what, what is the solution? You know, it's, I mean, you know, but you, you, what is the long, the solution such, such that you too can thrive? Right. And, and don't just carry this burden for as long as you can, and then you sink down, and that's the end of that. That's something we need to be figuring out, organizations like ours. But it's interesting to figure out, too, you know, we made the decision for Yes to Cannibal to not seek nonprofit status. You know, maybe someday we'll revisit it yeah. um, because there's so much enmeshment in kind of self-reproduction and self-justification. Yeah. Um and I, one thing I find quite interesting is, you know, I think of nonprofits as a great example of kind of base liberalism in some, in some regard, political liberalism. And um, so much now is about sort of representation, right? So so much yeah. is about kind of like representation of diversity. And this is all kind of carefully tracked and charted, et cetera. And I would say that with the SV Cannibal, we set out with an almost humanist impulse, right? Like kind of maybe taking... You know, the, the White Panthers, as an example, you know, the first line of the White Panthers party says, we fully agree with the Black Panthers, you know, and then they move <laughs> on to their own stuff. Yeah. And what I'm struck by is that when I look at the diversity of the cast of characters who've been involved in the SV Cannibal, I'm actually kind of shocked by it. You know, we have definitely not, for the most part, replicated kind of yeah. you know, a sort of upper middle class, highly educated white demographic. Yeah. Not and in a funny way, that was actually achieved not by design, but by just this kind of openness to anyone who was willing to do something. Yeah. Um, so getting back to the book, I guess. Um, oh, I well, think- no, on that note, that, I mean, that's, that's really super interesting uh, what, what you're saying here. Um, um, so, so first of all, there's someone named Thaddeus Squire. I don't know if you want to jot down his name and look up some of his work. He... Uh, He's trying, he, his, he has a big project. In fact, Inside Seminar started uh, in a project that he began in Philadelphia called Culture Works. It was a space for, uh, for um, like cultural nonprofits to gather and do the work. And, you know, they would arrange for like all the back end stuff, like they do your bookkeeping and this and that and the other thing. But he slowly turned against the nonprofit sector for similar reasons that you're naming here. But like me and and you were not, he doesn't want to abandon the notion. He doesn't want to like abandon it to these people or doing these things to it that he doesn't like. He's rather, he's rather trying to think through what nonprofit sector might look like going forward or more socially responsible with a kind of anti-capitalist bent, bent or et cetera. I, I don't really know the details, but uh, he, he might be. Social impact know. comments? What, pardon me? Social impact comments? Yes, 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 exactly. And Another thing you said there, Matt, is, is so Insight Seminars, I, I just, without even thinking about it, became a nonprofit in the beginning. But then I s- slowly started to learn some of the problems. We're really more like a cooperative. We still do have nonprofit status. And until we can figure out a good reason to get rid of it, well, I guess we'll just hang on to it. But 
we, we really want to operate more like a cooperative. Um, another point you made about kind of the, it's a big, big issue with us is the struggle to really become an obviously inclusive space for people. I mean, if you look at our facilitator site on insightseminars.com, you can see we've made real progress. Like, you know, just scroll through and you can see there's, you know, but it's been, it's been a real struggle. And, and I reflect on this. I haven't done some sort of super careful analysis of it, but I'm trying to understand why is it hard to get people other than like, you know, middle class, white, educated people offering seminars or coming to the sessions and I one one of the reasons I, I stumbled on is how profoundly segregated our, our society is. Yes. It doesn't just stop like at the door at insight seminars. And the other thing is some of those like it 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 it's like like any other kind of social change, it requires it, like strategy and effort and genuineness and and it's not just gonna happen because you wish it to. Um yeah, so that's something we we struggle with a lot as well. It's, yeah. and, I think we've made. Some, I think we've we've really are getting more of a, rep, a reputation of being an open, inclusive space, um, but it takes it takes work, and it's. I don't know. Well, I, it, I was very pleased about that. I was unfortunately only able to sit in on the the practice policy once or twice, and I believe you guys read Radical Dharma. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, I know you recently hosted Catherine Kittrick, and definitely have kind of engaged with you know the sort of like big emergent sort of abolitionist you know, yeah. cultural reform, et cetera, movement. And I'm I'm just curious, you know, sort of how, how does that work? What does it mean to you? Like, how does it kind of change your project? How does it fit into it? Have you had engagement with like the Black anarchist tradition, for instance? You know, which yeah. is really interesting. I, I mean, we had the the first person who shows up on our soul time list is, is, is uh, Ashanti Alston. He was a member of the Black Panther Party. We, we, we encountered him because we had it in our anarchist reading group. We read from the Black Anarchist Reader, and he had some pieces in there that were really fascinating. So we got in touch with him, and he did a, a, an amazing session with us. We've also been trying to get Marquise Bay, who wrote Anarcho Blackness, uh, to do sessions. When we he, we were lined up to do it, but then he got well, he he couldn't do it, so we we had to reschedule. But um, but one of the issues that comes up with Alston, uh, Ashanti Alston and Marquise Bay is the fact that African-American community in America, if, you know, in black radical tradition hues more closely to Marxism sure. and that the suspicion towards anarchism. So that they actually write about the difficulty of, of, of making even anarchism, you know, le less white, you know, and making it more appealing to, you know, whatever, communities of color, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they struggle with that themselves as part of what they write about. Um, yeah. It's it's interesting. And then, so I wonder, I mean, there is so much new and in many ways, very admirable and kind of, I think, exciting attention to dealing, you know, with racial capitalism in Buddhism and particularly in sort of engaged Buddhism, you know, kind of other, other schools and other sort of nodes of Buddhism. Um, and I guess I kind of wonder how that relates to, and in, in some in some regard, does that have a relationship to that influence of Marxism on the Black radical tradition? Is there something about this sort of structure, you know, that people, is, is there a relation, right, between the influence of Marxism on the Black radical tradition and the fact that I would say that many of the kind of engaged uh, Buddhist projects I've seen that are really trying to take seriously you know, the black radical tradition also are, I would say, perhaps more invested in liberalism. Um, do you think that's a real connection? Or? Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, maybe, maybe in some way you say like they're, they're, they're taking their cue from that or they're part and parcel of being involved in that, that discourse is the connection to, of the black radical uh, tradition to m more Marxist oriented thought. Is this what you're saying? Well, I'm wondering aloud, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not even sure it holds up, but I'm I'm curious because, uh, you know, I can certainly see that you are engaged, you know, with sort of abolition. You're engaged with kind of the Black radical tradition. You talk about some of the difficulties with that, but clearly that is sort of a more constant presence. And I wonder also how it affects your thought. I mean, if you look like, anarchism. what was that last part? In, in both Buddhism and anarchism, oh. I wonder what sort of abolition has meant to you in the past few years. Like with the mm -hmm. uprising, how did you respond to it last year? Well, you know, go to, 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 to write about it, I should say. It <laughs> might be connected with like um, 
when you hear, for example, Ashanti Alston talk about why he became anarchist, why he left the Black Panther, which Marxist orientation uh, was realizing the kind of misogyny or pa patriarchy, authoritarianism that he found in the more Marxist oriented Black Panther Party uh, and Black, other sort of Black, you know, just when you say, like, if you do an analysis of what we call the Black radical tradition, um, it often is sort of has blind spots in, in terms of the kinds of oppressions that operate within, like the misogynists, for example. I mean, he, he would argue. Um, and I, yeah, I, this, I love this idea of, of, I love, I love the basic idea of total liberation, which says that, you know, who, who was it? The, I think Marky Spay makes this point in Anarcha Blackness that, like, let's, he says, like, if you, if, 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 if Black women feel free and liberated from, harassment and oppression and constraint than everyone will be because they have it the hardest you know he, he makes he makes his point um and then but of course there's always going to be someone who says well then there's this other group what about animals <laughs> you know what about the environment and uh i like that that impulse in total liberation which is, is frustrating because right? there's always something around the corner you haven't quite thought of like to me i think of i include animals in my notion of Liberation and anti-oppression, and other people have included the plant life and you know the environment and so forth. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. <laughs> no, no, I think you are. I mean, it's just just thinking aloud. But I mean, I think yeah. it's also then you know it does sort of take me back to cruelty in some regard and something kind of almost gnostic about. I mean, you you, you write about our toes being kind of gnostic, right? In cruel theory, spun practice, and. Um, you know, on the one hand, there is sort of how do we conceive total liberation? What does it mean to be totally liberated? Yes, there is to be the, the basic anarchist principle of, you know, all relationships should be consensual, you know, uh, all relationships should be kind of free of domination, right? And, and at very, very core. Yeah. Um, but then at some point, you know, do we have a kind of uh, overly humanist perspective on what that means? Is it okay? Yeah, to I I, what was that last part then? I'm sorry. Well, I mean, do, do we assume that this means that plants don't want to be eaten and animals? Well, don't want to be eaten? Humanist disaster, so like human centric. And I was also thinking: Do we also have kind of an, an enlightenment humans notion that that we we can't have this situation of? I forget the exact terms you you used of of non non coercion. What were the word, two words you used there? Um, non, non -domination. Consensual and non domination. Consensual and non domination because. My critical mind, my analytic mind, really immediately starts saying, "Well, it, I see it in anarchist circles. I saw it in punk rock circles, all kinds of liberatory circles, the kinds of coercions and dominate forms of domination that start emerging, even subtle ones." About like I see that the anarchist group I've been going to for forever in Philadelphia. They're, they're, when you walk into it, you can feel that there's a, a culture there. There's an ideology there. There, there are subjects that count as good and bad subjects, and even though they're using the language of non-authority and non-coercion and non-domination, it's happening in, in, you could argue, subtle ways because part of the ideology says you can't have overt performances that are domineering or you can't have like, like explicit policies that are hierarchical. But that doesn't mean these things don't happen. In fact, in a way, they become invisible and go underground and become subconscious in a way, subconsciously live, that they become even more dangerous. Uh, so, so that's what I thought you were going to say about the kind of humanist, like an, an enlightened humanist idea that these sorts of things are even possible right. ultimately, you know, but yeah, again, like also human centric. Absolutely. I, I'm totally convinced. I try very hard to be like not non species you know, right. in my language at all. Um, and I, I, just, I just saw something they real quickly, this is really on Facebook of all places. It was like an anarcho-communist uh, post. Someone posted some meme, like saying, say, like detailing how your your cream for your coffee gets to you and how it's rape and theft and violence and all this from human humans and other animals and all this. And um, the, the the discussion of like sixty eight comments was utterly hostile towards the original post. Mm. Uh, and and this is like anarcho-communist groups. That's going too far. That's not included in liberation. 
animals, you know. So you're always going to bump into this, I find. Like it's, it's, which in some sense is great because it's, we're constantly being, our, our blind spots are being exposed to us. We can make decisions at some point whether we want to subscribe to some particular form of anti-oppression. Like, I don't know how far I'd go with that with, with plants. I know people who say, um, like, it even applies to water and the air. Like, and then I, when someone, someone, I had this conversation with someone, and the next time I had to go to, like, to the bathroom, I was like, oh, shit, do I flush the toilet? Like, what am I doing to the water? <laughs> Like, I, and I, I don't know if I can do, actually do anything with this. You know? <laughs> I don't know what the, the ramifications are. So I'm going to leave that like in my oppression camp for now. <laughs> but that's actually kind of a really good example, if a bit scatological, in that there is a <laughs> way in which, you know, if we begin to sort of extend the circle of protection, right, to plants and species and water and et cetera, are we kind of validating being? Are we trying to kind of, I mean, we're trying to kind of create a metaphysics, you know, the presence, like where all things should be, be, you know, and be allowed to be. And we're trying to kind of actually, yeah. solidify, you know, yeah. like, is there a way in which it's a fixity? Like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm just very high to Gary and Richardson in there in a way. Um, yeah. And again, it's like, it's like what I do with the Buddhist critique is like, when you look at Buddhist ideas of enlightenment and, you, and how you get there, the question eventually arises, like, first of all, is this possible? And even if it is possible, is it even desirable to live a life like that? And sometimes that comes up with anti-oppression discourse or liberatory discourse or anarchist discourse. It's like the question of, is this even po is this possible and is it even necessarily desirable? Like, you know, and, and are we then confronted with some horrible contradiction that to be human involves forms of, of killing and violence? And like, like, how do we begin to to really live a, a fully you know, anti-dominating way of life. And that's not just, you know, based on some imaginary plenitude, it's actually grounded in. You know? right. That's why, That's why again, I talk in here about the importance of utopia. Mm -hmm. I, I like the fact that like in the Frankfurt School people, like they insist that even after the Holocaust and all they're, they're thinking about the coming revolution and how disappointed they were they still, at the end, will say utopia must remain an element in our thinking. What would it mean to think about your relationship to one another outside, like that there's no utopian possibility there, you know, as a possibility even, maybe unrealizable. I like John Clark's idea of what is that in the possible community of possible impossibilities, right? It's yes. kind of a utopian notion. Yeah. So, um, so with the book, one of the things I love about the book is, you know, again, the uh, I feel that I could give this book to my, my mom happens to be, oh, I, I think I've already turned her on to anarchism over the years, but um, had I not, I feel I could give this book to her, right? And I think I could convince her, you know, very similar. I, I try to write it just to get people to say that. I love it. I mean, and but I love the way that you take Weber, you know, about your brief passage on Weber, you know, and sort of reinterpret, you know, not even reinterpret him, but really kind of say, Look, here's what he said about anarchism, which I find so powerful. Hey, I know, incredible, isn't it? Yeah, That's really cool. incredible. Yeah, um, he spent that time in that weirdo community. So he was, again, like exposed to the values and the ideas in everyday life. It's not like when he went to that community in Switzerland, was it Ascana? I forget, but he, he, it wasn't like people were standing up preaching about anarchism. They were living it. And this is what affected him so deeply. Well, I think like this is, uh, I mean, I don't know that we've ever hit on the right phrase for it, but there's something about freaked space, right? There's something about kind of being in spaces that are heterotopic, you know, that are kind of actually other, you know, that even a small engagement with him and a small encounter with that can yeah. really, really be. I agree. You know, I, I um, do agree with that. That's the idea of the temporary autonomous zone as well, isn't it? Yeah. And on the one hand, we have to be careful that we're not just like giving into the neoliberal idea, you know, the Margaret Thatcher idea that there is no society or there is no alternative. There, there's no space in which you can actually have agency. On one hand, we have to be careful about that, I think. Like, uh, you know, like what Murray Birchin talked about, lifestyle, anarchism, um, to say like we've kind of given up on, like, that's why I talk about here, the, the macro, the meso, and, and, and um, what, what was the third one, macro, meso? Micro, micro, right? <laughs> uh, like, what is the, like, where can we operate? Like, since 1939, I don't know, maybe a little bit after Seattle, but it, since, like, after the Spanish Civil War, have people really thought seriously of a 
of a macro, you know, revolution, anarchism. I don't know, but Murray Bookchin is analysis that it's retreated in, into kind of minute personal micro ethics might have some validity to it. I don't know. And then the, that, you know, uh, Zen, Howard Zen says we should get away from this heroic idea of heroic gestures and it's just the little things that can matter and they can add up and they can affect people. That's why I kind of struck, I, I really realized I, it's very much, I think one of the stories I really loved as a kid was the three bears, you know, and, and she always settled on the middle, the middle one was just right. <laughs> Maybe the Buddhist middle way also. <laughs> but, you know, like, how can, how can you, and I, I think it's true what you're saying, there, something profound can happen when someone comes out of a certain kind of regimented, you know, wave of, of, of experiencing things and comes into a freak zone, like you put it, you know, something profound can happen. I absolutely agree. That's why we need these spaces. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting with the question of sort of growth too, where on the one hand, you know, this question of like, do you grow insight? Do you grow yes a candle? Is it necessary? You know, or is it necessary to just endure and yeah. be solid? Like, you know what I mean? Right. Like, how much of this do we need or can we through contagion in some way? I like that. I, I love that notion. I mean, the growth model is very capitalist too. Not to say that, ideas of growth didn't exist before capitalist ec economics. I mean, you can maybe have a growth model that's not the capitalist imperative that if you're not growing, then you're you're failing somehow. But um, yeah, I liked what you say there about, is it enough just to be to sustain it and have this, what was the term you use? Is epidemiological or this contamination? Contamination. Yeah, yeah. Kind of mimetic effects. Yeah. yeah, we think about that too with inside seminars is like, is, you know, yeah, it's hard to figure that out, isn't it? Because, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Um, we really struggle not to define success in terms of large numbers, like how many people showed up. Like sometimes the, 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 the sessions with seven people are the most memorable, you know, the ones with 150 are not. So that that can't be the measure. But it's the measure of success that's imposed on us. Right. On me. So you still meditate. I, I I do, I and mean, you know I think sitting, you know, th that's the interesting thing is like meditation is already a very complex notion. Like to sit still and silent and attentive as a human being, I still find very valuable. In fact, I'll tell you something real quick about that because for ten years, for maybe not ten years, for for several years, I stopped altogether meditating because I felt like I was creating a kind of it became kind of like an armor for me, like I could endure anything with just enough meditation like even a, like get rid of a hangover you know or sadness or just go sit for an hour and and i i wanted to be more exposed to things so i i stopped for a long time meditating and then i started oh here's what happened after 10 years i i i went back to teaching undergrads in college and i was teaching a course on zen buddhism and we talked so much about meditation and they saw images of meditating monks. They, they asked if we could do a session on meditation. So I said, okay, so we did it. And it was, it was unbelievable. So I hadn't taught meditation in 10 years. I mean, I hadn't taught students, young people in 10 years. I'd been at the Wan Institute. It's all adult, you know, adult education. And, um, and the, the ability to sit still, the ability to pay attention, had deteriorated like I never could have imagined with, with these young people. It's like they were tormented going like two minutes without their phone being checked or they were tormented, asked to sit still for five minutes. And it made me realize, damn, there, there is a value here. I want to live in a world where people can sit still, silent and attentive for for three hours, if that's what it takes, I want to I want to live among those people, you know. And I could give reasons for why I think that's valuable. And so yes, I, I I'm back to, to 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 meditating and and not really teaching it, but creating a space where that happens. If I were to put you on the spot to kind of characterize uh, the three vehicles, right? How would you? And it's, you're certainly not under no obligation, but I'm just curious if you were to think of the value or how you would understand the three vehicles as they relate to this broader also political practice. Yeah. That's, great. You... that's really interesting. I mean, I think, I think, I think Tara Valder would be kind of conservative, you know, 
Mayana may be kind of more liberal progressive and, <laughs> and it could be anarchist. I mean, <laughs> I, I love that, you know, certain versions of, of, of tantric tradition of inversion of values and yeah. Yeah, I like it, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's real potential there to, to, ups, to, to create a subject who upsets the status quo. I had when when I left Shambhala, um, I had this idea to start a decentered Vajrayana community without a guru. Uh, <laughs> it, it, actually, the person I was working with died, unfortunately, and so it didn't oh. happen. But I still think, and I, I'm not the person to do it, but I still think it's a fascinating idea, like the Vajrayana without the guru. You know, that is fascinating. God, idea. who we've seen with the gurus, you know. Every single one in the past few years, you know, every single one is corrupt. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, well, see, so that's very interesting. So that, that goes back to this question of how how to exercise authority or leadership. And what you're saying about, was it Kleistra? I'm not sure how to say his name. Kleistra. Uh, huh? uh, Pierre Kleistra. Kleistra, the anthropologist. Um, um, is that what he is, an anthropologist? I think so, right? Yes, Kleistra. he was. He died tragically quite young. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, that might be, so again, that might be the question of, of, so this is what we do. Like we abandon a form because we see how problematic it is rather than think that maybe what's problematic is the way this form has been ex practiced, performed, exercised. Um, so what, what would it be to be, kind of, you know, I like the Lacanian idea of the, of the, 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 the analyst is someone who, you know, who just, who refuses to create. A certain kind of subject that most people are expecting because you know, it's a, the analyst discourse will refuse to 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 do what you expect an analyst to do like give you the answers and heal you and all that sort of thing um what what would it, what maybe that's something to think of. what would a new buddhist teacher be like like what what is a viable form of a buddhist teacher i mean is it necessarily just abandon the form altogether yeah i this, this is the stuff i think we need to figure out in the 21st century well, and then I'm, I'm surprised that in a way, um, I'm actually somewhat surprised in an anarchist manifesto how little Buddhism there is. Um, I'm also surprised there's no mention of Laura Well um, in the book. I didn't see well, it. Would your mother be interested in Laura Well? I mean, or, or Buddhism? Yeah, I wrote <laughs> it. Would your mother be interested in reading about Laura Well or Buddhism? I don't think so. Fair enough, yeah. yeah. I really, you know, you know, there's all these books about how to write and how to writing, and I've always ignored all of them. But the one I obeyed in this one was to write it with a specific audience in mind. So I wrote this with all the liberal people I've been around my whole life with them in mind to keep them reading it. You know, I don't want to bring in like unnecessary theory or anything like that. Like, yeah, people who read this and then read this, they can't believe it's written by the same person because this is so <laughs> it's very easy to read, I think. And, and this is not. I mean, I would agree. It's yeah. a great point, but it's a challenge. Um, so how do you deal then with, I mean, one one aspect of, of, you know, sort of liberal, contemporary liberal thought, you know, that is meaningful to many people is the question of representation, right, of people, you know, previously marginalized. So even when we say Hillary Clinton, right, and we may have certain ideas there, it is very difficult to fully let go of some of that symbolic power, and certainly with Obama, you know, and so yeah. how, do you, yeah. how do you relate to that now? I mean, you mentioned again, in this, to some degree in the book, but I'm curious to hear you say more um as anarchists can we um can we sort of appropriate that and hold on to something you know vis-a-vis -vis buddhism and the importance of symbols even can we yeah. hold on to that notion well what what, what you're saying about like representational democracy is that can i say something about oh, that go ahead, anything well, well, I, 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 I really have trouble thinking at the, this large scale macro level i i really i admire people like john clark you know, Murray Brookchin, Peter Kropak, and they get, they have this capacity to think through how actual life might look on the ground with all its complexities. That's really important. I can't do that. But I could say, can you imagine your own organization there in, in these terms, like without, you know, in terms of without re the representationalism or, or whatever? That's that's what I would encourage people to do even their own relationships or friends groups like that. That's what I try to make the case in here is like, yeah, don't, don't like think that we have to create anarchism at some sort of macro level. And then it's going to be anarchism. No, that's not going to be the case. Start thinking about how these, these values can manifest in your, in your everyday life and your everyday environments. That's hard enough. I think, yeah. but I'm not sure you were, you might've been asking something else there towards the end. I think it's related. I mean, I think, uh, 
one of the sort of big questions, I guess, that kind of lingers in my mind, um, with, even with this book, though, is uh, how do we deal with and relate to whiteness, right? So we kind of save this question towards the end because I think it's such a big one. So, you know, some people understand sort of whiteness in terms of habit, some in, like understand it in terms of power domination, some understand it in terms of affect, some understand it in terms of kind of historical, you know, um, discord, et cetera. So is there a way for a kind of Buddhist anarchist practice to do something? Is it uniquely suited to do something with the problem of whiteness or the phenomenon of whiteness? I think there are great resources for that. I mean, I don't know if they're uniquely, there might be others, but anarchism and Buddhism seem to be, have the resources for, for recognizing your subject position and, and formation. And that it's one of privilege. And, you know, I, my, the students, like I, I have students, I tell them all the time, like I try to get them to have dialogues and conversations because that's what I value. And they know that I could literally talk for three hours and, and not ever let them. And I see there's some people here, I don't know, the, you know, who are muted. Maybe we can unmute it and get them in on the conversation. Uh, but to me, it's, it's yeah, I think anarchism and Buddhism do offer very good resources if it's if they're really followed through. Of course, what happens is this is a basic premise of my critique of Buddhism. And I, I could do a similar critique with anarchism is the, the formations actually kind of shore up against their own their own premises, their own possibilities. Like Buddhism has these kind of liberatory possibilities in it. Emptiness, no self. And what would an analysis of no self be in terms of you know, the racial, you know, racialization? Um, you know, what, what would some of these anarchist principles, if really followed through, look like in terms of social organization and all that? And um, why does it turn out that, well, that's a whole nother question. Why does it turn out that that we find the same sorts of segregation and oppressions and like male dominance, et cetera, et cetera, in Buddhist formations and anarchist formations, even though the goods seem to be there. And so then to me, it becomes an issue of how they're, they're practiced, just like I said about leadership, but they do have the resources, but it, it takes, it takes a, a critical like undoing, like, like who is that? Uh, Coleman Barks. He, he, he did like these re, um, can, sort of translations of Rumi poems. And he said the catalyst was uh, someone said to him at a party, they were talking about Rumi and someone says, Rumi needs to be like free, Rumi needs to be freed from his cage that he's been placed in. And something similar about these potential, mm -hmm. these concepts and practices, they need to be actually taken and placed in an analytic of, of racialization and whiteness and all that. I mean, the Buddhists didn't address that, anarchists didn't address that. I mean. But they can't be they can't be put in that analytic or that analysis for sure. He, um, I know that sort of early on um, you received some pointed criticism about kind of dealing with Buddhism more in the sense of the kind of, you know, later white practitioner with less sensitivity, obviously, to the Asian Americans, you know, who brought Buddhism to the U.S. And I wonder if you were to rewrite earlier work now, how you would deal with that or how you respond to that now um I don't, yeah i don't think i i would i mean no, I'm, i mean i see that critique has come up like magazines like buddha dharma they're trying to address it and so forth i i think my my critique applies to like asian buddhist communities just as much as to like white buddhist middle class buddhist communities i think but yeah i i chose i that wasn't the critique I was into. I, I say in this book, there are lots of critique, like paths to critique. You could take like the critique from like the, the what does uh, Zizek call it? The, uh, the, what does he call it? The, like the imbecilic, he, 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 I forget, like the, the language of well-being, the language of wisdom. Right. The tautological stupidity of the, of the, uh, the, the, the saying, the, the wise saying. That could be one way of critique, and I do that in here. You could critique it through the, the kind of well-being or self-help industry. You could critique it via the ideas of neoliberal subjectivity. You could also critique it in terms of what you just described. Uh, but these are paths to me that are not to a critique that aren't to me like hard-hitting and essential enough. But yeah, I, mean, it's I, mean, I think that's very bold, though, because I mean, to me, that really gets to. I mean, I'm interested to hear you say that. Um, 
you know, because some of those critiques were strong or ugly in some regard. And uh, I don't, I'd have to look back at them, but it's interesting to me to hear you really affirm that no, you're really talking, you're really talking about Buddhism, you know, like in some sense, you're really uh, talking about Buddhism as a theological system, an ontological system, et cetera. Um, I find that quite, that gives me a lot to think about. That's very powerful. Well, I mean, one of the moves that Laura Well makes is, um, it's kind of like, you know, Dorno does something similar, like, 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 Adorno would say you need first need to generalize before you because if you start off with details, there's always going to be criticism of the detail. And people are going, to, are going to come at it from numerous angles and you never get anywhere. So you start off with kind of generalization. Laura Well takes that even to a farther extreme and really wants to abstract the thing. I, I think of like abstract painting in a way, like say what the Cubists did, and they, they wanted to break it down to some basic form. Um, and so there's something going on in this Laurel and critique that's abstracted of particulars like that. Maybe that's worthy of a critique. Someone could criticize that too, but I, you know, I find it, I find it valuable. I think you could take this critique and apply it to a purely Asian community or, and you, it would be like a good organon or heuristic. Mm -hmm. You've seen certain things going on there. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, you're touching on some too that it, it's impossible to avoid current discourses. Current discourses start seeping into the formation, correct? I mean, like, so American Buddhism is very influenced by the, you know, the beats and the hippies and, and then later like neoliberalism, which caught hold of like the yuppies who got interested in Eastern spirituality. And, and it's, it's not like they're coming into some, some sealed off, hermeneutically sealed off formation. They're start bringing all that with them. And now coming into it is like, critiques from ident identitarian politics or woke culture. And so these critiques are starting to bear on, on, on Buddhism as well and how we receive it. I guess part of my answer is like, you can't do everything, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Glenn, I'd be interested to hear about the lineage of your interest from Buddhism to anarchism. So it's something I've heard Matt talk about, how there was a sort of, um, lineage of interest in these practices and then you brought up this idea of discipline um and so how that sort of how you've negotiated that i mean i i think i mean i think um again it's like we have this current dis discourse that's happening and i'm a little older generation so you know i i i come out of another way of thinking about it. it's like um, that's, that's kind of anti-authoritarian, but in a different sense, like a distrust of authority um, and, or, or kind of, you know, I want to do what I want to do. You know, I, I come things from my own perspective. And I think there's, there's power and beauty and truth to all that, but I, I think it presupposes certain other things like a, a disciplined practice or, I mean, you know, before before you can critique something, I want like I tell my students like uh, this is my own practice was to fully appreciate something in the terms it's trying to present itself in, and then you then you can critique it. But the appreciation comes first, and that that requires effort and 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 discipline, and it, it, it takes time. I guess I come out of kind of a, an old fashioned notion in that way that the formation of a person takes time and effort and energy. And I always like the fact that in Indian Buddhism, it's so contrary to the way modern day Buddhists talk about things because Indian Buddhism talks about meditation as a form of labor and effort and work. And it's all skill development. And the Buddha says meditation is really no different from learning to play a, you know, an instrument or becoming a master craftsman or that kind of language, I guess, it's interesting that it resonates with me because I come, I come from a very undisciplined background. My parents were extraordinary lenient people. I mean, I was like never punished as a kid. I never had bedtimes or it's weird. Maybe or maybe not. Maybe there is a connection. Maybe the psychoanalysts can figure it out. But um, yeah, um, but that's I don't, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Um, but yeah. Well, I think it's interesting that you know. Uh, as an as an educator now working in 
field of design, right? You want to teach people skills, but you also want to teach them how to be creative thinkers. Yeah. And I find um, more and more that, you know, a lot of really young people, they want, they want the form without the discipline. They're not interested in the discipline. Beautiful. Yeah. They want the authority. You know, I, I, yeah. Right. They want the authority without the practice. So this is it. So it, when I when I was moved when I I, I got my first par- apartment outside uh, my parents' house. I was 15 years old, and I I, I moved it with with some friends, and and one of these was an 18 year old friend of mine, Peter, who was starting to study at Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and we lived together for a bunch of years. So what what here's with Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. You know, oh oh wait, you guys are you're not in Philadelphia. Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts is super old fashioned, like, you know, early, maybe even late 18th century. I don't know, definitely 19th century, uh, like fine arts academy. And the first three years, my friend Peter never made an original stroke, he said. He was learning how to paint like the, the masters. And in the fourth year, you could be creative. And I, yeah, I was so struck. I thought I thought that was just incredible. And it is this idea, this Zen idea that first comes discipline and then comes freedom. And a little bit, I think we can see, and you're right, I think the name, it, like it's hard, it's hard to know what to do because you want to foster creativity and intelligence and individuality and self-initiation, but you also responsibly know what it takes to develop or maybe you think you know because of your own training. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to figure it out. Like this, this, this book, Ranciere says, uh, if you're not liberate, teaching to liberate, like teaching a person to f- discover their own intelligence, creativity, et cetera, et cetera, then you're serving to make them more stupid. But it's presupposed on a profound discipline that is driven by desire. And he gives us an example, an 18th century educational experiment where some guy taught uh, um, Flemish speaking students. He didn't know Flemish and they didn't know French. He was French to, 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 to master the French language without his involvement. He, it, it presupposed a deep desire. And, and from that deep desire came a self-generated discipline and, and longevity, and endurance. I, I don't know how to do it something really interesting that ties back to your, you know, the way you end the book with hope, right? Is that there's this idea that the way attention spans are, are taken and molded by all our contemporary media, it it works to kind of cut off possibility and that, that really erodes the desire for a discipline. What would be the point? Absolutely. Absolutely. So now we're getting to, now we we sound like old fogies here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, but, but I, I think a good case to be made, and, and I have to say, my my young daughters make this case, you know, and and they, you know, not quite like we are, but um, that they 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 believe that you know that that things slip too quickly into a kind of you know I don't know what Murray Berkson would call you know or you know the kind of slips too quickly into. Um, and anything goes and anyone can do it. I, I don't I don't know. I'm, I'm feeling like an old person talking like this, but I don't know. Maybe a case a case can be made. If, you know, we got to be careful. Jordan Peterson, Peterson talks like this, too. So we got to be careful. Right. Like to get get the the, disc, the language right. Um, you find yourself, though, like with uh, someone like Peterson still working to be generous with him. Uh, what about being generous to, towards okay. him? I find myself, you know, it's an old habit. So with Trump or Jordan Peterson, yeah. I find myself still oh, yeah. feeling like it's part of a practice yeah. to be generous. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting you say that because the other day I was, I was talking to my class about how, like, I was reading some QAnon stuff and I was realizing, uh, you know, that at the core, at the very beginning of it all, I stand with QAnon, like in, in the sense that <laughs> distrust the government, you know, we think... We, we have all these ideas about what's going on. It's just as soon as we start analyzing what that is, we veer off into completely opposed you know, spheres of the universe. But I agree, like 
like when Trump talks about the press, I'm like, I actually agree. This is pretty fake, you know. <laughs> and then I realize like what he means. Like to him, it's only the stuff that's against him that's fake. And I'm like, no, it's all it's all stupid and ideological and. That, that creates kind of generosity. I agree. And there's something about Jordan Peterson. I was looking at his new book recently. Yeah, it's like, it's like so many more new rules. And, and I was reading the rules. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you? Yeah. yeah. It's like 19 new rules or something. And I was, I was like, if I didn't know Jordan Peterson, I was like, this is pre- these are pretty decent rules. The one rule I didn't like was like, don't be ideological. I'm like, this whole book is ideological. <laughs> But, but I understand that. And, and well, also- it's, it's interesting. He, you know, I, I gained a little more generosity or, or, or empathy for him when I read some of what he had to say about like Derrida. And you're like, he has no idea yeah. what he's talking about. And like, he's really <laughs> Even sympathy or generosity, yeah. sympathy or perhaps sympathy more. Yeah. Yeah, because but, you, you know, it's funny. I saw. Um, I'll send you the image. I think we posted it on Twitter and Instagram. But there's a Chinese company who is making really classic sort of Buddhist sculptures, but it's Trump. Well, Did you I saw that. Yeah. I loved it. Oh my God. And you can read it in many ways, but it's wonderful. Well, I mean, in, a way, so in the way what you're addressing there is important too. It's like, maybe it's partly an ant. Like now everything is so like polarized. We all hear that all the time. And it's true. If you even use certain language or if you even question certain ideas, you're dismissed or you're put in certain camp, you're labeled with certain, having a certain identity and, and 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 that's that's can't be healthy, can it? No. I mean, so maybe this idea of having more generosity awesome. with certain thinkers is a kind of antidote to that. Although it's already given in the current theological landscape, you're already positioning yourself in a problematic way toward right by even saying let's let's be a little generous at the beginning. I mean, I mean, I think it's it's interesting because this actually, I would say for me, is actually well, probably one of the big divides I discover between Buddhists and anarchist circles. You know, anarchists are um, often quite scathing, willing to say, F this, this is idiotic. And I certainly have that side myself, you know, but it always rubs up against this sort of discomfort from a sort of like the Buddhist part of myself, you know, or historically Buddhist part of myself that I don't feel comfortable doing this. Like I can't, I can't ever forget you know, and maybe it's just a platitude the Bodhisattva vow at some point. I don't know. But like, you know, on some level, I'm responsible for these beings. I can't call them idiots, you know, like. It's go- it goes back to what you said, though, about about cruelty and compassion. Right. Like, uh, the Buddha the, does some questionable stuff if you read those old Pali suttas. Yeah. He called people names. I was reading I was reading a Pali text with students and in class ones and graduate students. And, and we were all like scratching our heads like he's calling this person a female dog like what could that be about and then we all were like oh <laughs> cancel the meta yeah i mean <laughs> exactly and, and he's, he's like getting up and leaving because he has a bad back and then he goes out and just goes for a walk he's apparently which is bored or irritated and like again it's like this, this this prototype this model this representation of the enlightened teacher is probably you know it's like laura well says like Philosophers are people who do things they don't tell anyone about, and they and they tell people to do things they never do themselves, or something in that regard. It's like, I mean, what what we have to rethink this for ourselves. Like, what kind of you know ethics do we need? What kind of you know leader do we need to be? Like in the current situation, which is also part of that current situation, <laughs> is this uh, polarization and this this you know sensitivity to 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 you know like minute like identitarian issues that that don't always carry over you know from community to community you know what i mean yes yeah have you have you ever heard um there's a piece from i think trinman hod the tv show and alan ginsburg was on it with peter his partner peter olavsky playing cello and he sings he was a oh. student from Rinpoche, and he oh. sings this song oh. called do the meditation rock and uh, it's fantastic. Well, maybe we'll just post that at the end of this video and and uh, also send it to you. Um, but I think I think you'd like it quite a bit. I I know that we're out of time, and uh, I want to say sorry to those who are watching this later. But technology who are happens. These here? What's that? Who are these people on on this call? We've got John and Mitchell with us, and then oh. what we'll do is we'll we'll just go ahead and get this up to YouTube tonight so that we can just get oh. it out. Um, and, uh, it's been a great discussion. You're always one of the most interesting people to talk to. And we just adore you. Um, I, I, I gotcha. 
And uh, there was one more thing. What was it? Well, do you guys have questions, John and Michelle? For fun? Can they be unmuted or? Uh, yeah, we can unmute. Maybe we put them to sleep. Hey, Mitchell and John. Hey, everybody. You know, I, I'm not entirely comfortable with your your um, defensiveness around identity politics. So um, I think that uh, a Buddhist anarchist approach would um, sort of integrate those um, critiques as well. Um, so that's that's the only concern I have with your with your um, uh, presentation. And thank you for it. Sure. I mean, do you want to say more, like what you mean about that? I'd love to hear more. You know, I mean, I just think that 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 you know the point that folks are making about you know recognizing identity and difference as a primary site of struggle for social justice is an important um, critique, and um, that um, I think that that people. Um, that it concerns me when 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 certain sectors of the left um, dismiss it outright. So, yeah, I wouldn't want to. Do, I hope I'm going to sound like I'm dismissing it out loud. I mean, I mean, tremendous gains have come from being more and more sensitive to the fact that there are lots of different kinds of people in the world, and we have names for them, and we make spaces for them, and we permit permit them entry and so forth. So I'm I'm definitely not dismissing that it's, it can be like analyzed as another form of discourse that where certain issues and problems might arise. And I, I think that's that should be permitted as well. Like part of the problem is if you even start questioning these things and wanting to have certain kinds of conversations, you already, you know, Matt jokingly said, let's cancel the Buddha, but that that's a big part of what's going on now is is, is a lack of robust conversation about issues that I don't think is helpful for anybody personally, but I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if we're talking about the same thing or there's overlap there. Yeah, no. I, I mean, it's um, yeah. I, I just um, I don't disagree with you. I just um, just would advise just kind of um, and just caution about how 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 these. Uh, conversations are engaged in so that's all i think i mean this is part of what i was trying to get at with the big question of dealing with whiteness you know and the sort of like prevalence of whiteness the invisibility of whiteness at times to white people um i think was maybe a different way of trying to frame some of the same concern that i think mitchell is expressing um and uh you know it's interesting i i'd, I'd like to hear back from you in, in time about kind of like uh we're having Catherine McKittrick you know, who to me is one of the leading voices, just brilliant, brilliant uh, black geography scholar, you know, at Insight and some of the other work you're doing. Um, John John Clark actually recently proposed something I thought was very interesting that we shift the phrase decolonialism to talk about de-imperialism. Um, and to me, in some way that's resonant here, because to me that's a very anarchist impulse that you could almost map out as kind of uh, the anarchist version of the liberal decolon decolonization. It's, it's not that simple, but I think there's something something there. But I, I think it's all very tricky territory. Yeah, I, I also think real quickly on that note, like, again, what does that look like in a lived form? So I'm teaching this class on contemporary philosophy. And when you start looking at the books on the textbooks on contemporary philosophy, it's all the usual, you know, white, male, you know, heterosexual, uh, middle class or upper class people. And you realize, oh, this is like, this is a very... This is leaving out so much. It's so interesting. So I start putting together my own course and it's it's de-imperialized or decolonized in that it brings in people you realize who are not even technically philosophers, you know, like Bell Hooks or uh you know Stuart Hall or Franz Fanon. And 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 but they're thinkers and they're thinking things that philosophers think about or should be thinking about. And you realize that to make that move is to to really start dismantling a, a whole edifice that's been in place and that's unquestioned. You know, I think the students would not even necessarily question if we use the old fashioned contemporary philosophy because they, I don't, they're just such good su student subjects. I don't know. It's, it's so interesting the difference between 
you know, for instance, in the academic context, um, kind of reinventing the canon through a mean, through, through a view of a need for improving representation through this kind of more uh, abstract, difficult to define, genuine desire to actually include other human voices, you know? And so I see a lot of the former <laughs> and less of the latter. Um, Zora Neale Hurston, I think is a fantastic example of this where she died in obscurity and she's a genius, you know? I mean, she's a brilliant cultural anthropologist and she, uh, you know, was really rediscovered by good fortune um, and has sort of been brought back into the canon as an example of she, was extremely talented and had brilliant things to say. And really because of very, very complicated social formations was not given her her place. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this, this ethical question about kind of representation versus something else I can't put my finger on as the motivator for how we include difference is really critical to thinking about liberalism and anarchism maybe. Yeah. Well, Glenn, you're, uh, it's, it's great. I look forward to, to hearing more as, as uh, the journey progresses and we are in, uh, we'll post links to the book and I hope everyone will buy it. Um, it's really a fantastic read. I advise giving it to all your most conservative liberal uh, relatives because I think it'll change their mind and they'll be out in the streets breaking windows. Um, <laughs> breaking windows at Starbucks. Yeah, but we look forward to working more and more with Insight and uh, just yeah. staying in touch. I love what you guys are doing. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, keep it up and yeah, let's keep talking. Natural, natural, not for ons. Thank you. Oh, hey, John. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. I think it was Thank a year you. ago that I first met you. So it's been a year already. Oh my God. That was when all this started, right? Look what you guys have done in a year. Incredible. And you and John. I mean, we, we actually met with Joe Scheip earlier today and he and I were marveling that it's like a year since we had that meeting and it's like, all these reading groups and the yes, we can and insight and the crunch dot conference. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah, that's a good example of what you were talking about the contamination, right? As yeah, got new growing, it's very rhizomatic, like affecting new growths. And yes, all right, well, okay, okay. take care, and we'll get this up on YouTube tonight. So, thank you guys yeah. who did make it and spread the word that it will be there and everyone can watch. Thanks so much. Okay, Thanks, cheers, guys. Bye. Bye, peace. One, two, three, four. You want to learn how to meditate? I'll tell you now, cause it's never too late. I'll tell you how, cause I can't wait. It's just that great that it's never too late. The first thing you do when you meditate is keep your spine, your back bone straight. Sit yourself down on a pillow on the ground or sit in a chair if the ground isn't there. The ground isn't there if the ground isn't there sit where you are if the ground isn't there follow your breath out open your eyes sit there steady and sit there wise follow your breath right out of your nose follow it out as far as it goes follow your breath but don't hang on to the thought of your death in old saigon follow your breath when thought forms rise whatever you think it's a big surprise 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 all you've got to do is to imitate you're sitting meditating and you're never too late the thoughts catch up but your breath goes on you don't have to drop your nuclear bomb see a vision come say hello goodbye play it dumb with an empty eye see a holocaust recall your mind it just went past with the western wind the apocalypse in a long red car or a flying saucer sit where you are if you can't think straight and you don't know who to call it's never too late to do nothing at all do nothing at all nothing at all it's never too late to do nothing at all do the meditation follow your breath so your body and your mind get together for a rest get together for a rest get together for a rest relax your mind get together for a rest Sit for an hour or a minute every day You can tell the superpower to sit the same way You can tell the superpower to watch and to wait And to stop and meditate goes it's never too late It's never too late, it's never too late To tell the superpower to stop and meditate No, it's never too late, it's never too late To tell the superpower to stop and meditate
to the meditation, to the meditation, to the meditation, to the meditation. Learn a little patience and generosity, 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 and generosity. Get yourself together, lots of energy, and learn a little patience and generosity, 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 and generosity, 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 generosity. Yeah, generosity.